Happy Labor Day, everyone. I'm Dan Philgreen, and this is Shell Point Today for Monday, September 1st. All this week, we're going to be showing you some of our best aviation stories. We'd like you to start looking to the skies and save the date of the week of November 17th through 21st for this signature season opener that is going to be called Fantasy of Flight. The week will be full of flight-themed events and surprises. So to get you in the mood, we're going to hear from some Shell Point aviators. But first, let's not forget that it's Labor Day. There's going to be a celebration at the Crystal Room from 11 to 2 p.m. For $14.95, you can enjoy a fabulous buffet selection of ribs, salmon, chicken, and all the yummy sides. Music will be provided by Stan Malesko. Bid farewell to long summer days as we pause to recognize all that makes this country great. Come celebrate with a feast of food, fun, and music on this great American holiday. Speaking of food, as you make your dining plans for the week, keep in mind that the Palm Grill will be closed all this month for annual maintenance and upgrades. But the Crystal Room and the Island Cafe are open for the season now, and the Cafe Promenade reopened last week. So, hopefully, you won't go hungry. Now, I also happen to know where you can get a little bit of a bite tomorrow. At the Arbor. Tomorrow is the Tea and Tour Day, where you can not only get a snack, but get all of your questions answered about assisted living at Shell Point and get a tour of the beautiful facilities. It all starts at 9 a.m. in the Arbor Dining Room. If you'd like to attend, please reserve your spot by calling 454-2077. And now, without further ado, let's get to the airplanes. Today we present to you part one of the story of Bob Anderson of Turbin. After serving as a pilot during World War II, Bob learned that the military had an abundance of surplus airplanes which were being sold to the general public. Bob and his friends Ed and Charlie pooled their money and bought a DC-3, which was an ideal plane to carry cargo for long distances. So long before there was a FedEx or a UPS, these three friends established one of the first ever regular freight services that used airplanes instead of trains or trucks. Even though aviation was still pretty rough and tumble in those days, Bob and his friends successfully ran their business for 15 years. Now, it just so happens that the DC-3 is still in service right here in southwest Florida. Lee County Mosquito Control still utilizes the planes to spray insecticide. With their gracious permission, we took Bob and his old partner, Charlie, to visit some DC-3s, even climbing in the cockpit and starting the engines. All this week, we're telling the story of coastal airlines. And today, we begin with the early days, as told by founding member Bob Anderson. Hi, I'm Dan Philgreen for Shell Point TV, and we are out at the Buckingham Airfield in Fort Myers. And uh, I have with me Bob Anderson, who's a Shell Point resident, and his friend Charlie Baird of Palatka, Florida. And these two gentlemen have quite an interesting story to share about aviation, and we have the privilege of being out here with the Lee County Mosquito Control today, who are still flying the Douglas DC-3 aircraft that these gentlemen used to fly for Coastal Airlines, the airline that they uh, started and ran after World War II. So Bob, tell us about how you got interested in flying as a young man. I guess I started at a very early age, I think maybe five years old. Uh, airplanes were everything to me. And uh, uh, whenever I saw an airplane in the sky, I got <laughs> terribly excited. A barnstormer came, visited us during the summer, and and I would spend a lot of time out there with him. And and he one day he took me for a ride in an old Curtis Robin airplane. And so when I was accepted for flight school, it was the most, most exciting day of my life. How about that? And then and then Charlie, how about you? Well, I guess uh, I grew up in Palatka, and and my first encounter was an old Ford trimotor airplane. And uh, they stopped at the uh, field in Palatka and they were hauling passengers, taking them for a ride. Oh, yeah. and, and I can remember my uncle took me for a ride in the Ford Tri-Motor and it was two dollars mm. for, you know, two dollars a person. How about that? And after I was in the air, I just thought that that's something I'd always like to do. Mm -hmm. And so I, I always enjoyed flying from then on. And then a World War came along yes. and uh, kind of swept you guys up with many others of your age. And tell us about the military flying. I was in service at, when, the war, when the war started and immediately applied for flight school. And uh, 
took operational training in Cherry Point and flew in the Pacific during World War II. About you know, early 42 we met. I was an instructor in the mechanic school and Charlie came through my class huh. and, uh, and we were, developed a friendship almost immediately and he, in, he invited me to visit him in Palatka, Florida. How about that? <laughs> and, then, and then you had a third friend. That, that was a son of a Polish immigrant, Ed Zerzycki, a wonderful guy very talented guy, excellent pilot, super mechanic, and he was the third guy we, that we, we needed in our business. Right, in that business, okay, there was just a moment in time, the end of the war, there's fellows like you who had been trained, had experience on these airplanes, and a lot of surplus aircraft available for pennies, nickels on the dollar, right. and uh, all these factors came together to be able to do something that's really never been possible before. DC-3s were selling for $20,000. $20,000. And that, a $5,000 down payment, and that's all the money we had, uh -huh. $5,000. And then they were, be, they were being sold at Augusta, Georgia. Uh -huh. So I called Ed Zerzicki and I called Charlie and said, let's get together and buy a DC-3. Yep, yep. Brand, almost yep. a brand new DC-3. And now before this, before World War II, there really wasn't any such thing as shipping freight by air. Only in World War II did they start making the, uh, a cargo airplane with a, with a large door. And, and this is it, it's sitting right here. During the military was called the, uh, the uh, C-47. Yeah. So the C-47 and the civilian version, the DC-3. Right. This was the first airplane you had where you had a, where you could haul cargo with it because you had a cargo door, you know, that, that opened up. Most of your passenger planes only had one passenger door, you know, yeah. that you walked in. So tell us about Coastal Airlines. How did, tell us about your first, uh, your first job after you got that DC-3. We had no money, so we had to do uh, all the work on it ourselves to, to, to license it as a civilian aircraft. So it took us probably a month to get the airplane ready. And uh, of course, Zarzicki, our partner Ed Zarzicki, was a big help to us because he was a little old. He was two years older than we were. And he had a little more experience, a little better mechanic than we were. But we did, we did everything. We stripped the paint. We did modifications. And then we, uh, after we got the airplane ready, uh, we three of us jumped in our car and we headed south looking for business. <laughs> and our first stop was at, at John Bell's celery farm in, in Sanford, Florida. And Mr. Bell was a big man. He was about, weighed about 400 pounds, Jolly. <laughs> and so we tell him about our air freight service, and he's he's thinking, and he said, uh, can, can, "Can you fly a can you fly a load of celery plants to San Francisco?" <laughs> <laughs> wow, can we? Yeah, we sure can. And he's, he said, "How soon will you how soon will you be ready?" And we said, "We're ready now." <laughs> he said, "How about tomorrow?" So the next day we loaded we took a full load of celery plants to to San Francisco, California. So you guys not only flew the plane, you fixed the, fixed the plane, you loaded the celery, you were doing the whole deal. We, we, we did the whole deal almost the whole time we were in business. Yep. Our crews loaded, loaded and unloaded airplanes. We, we, we did it all. You did it all. Our airplane was beautiful though because we had a two, two tone, painted two-tone. Uh, a, a, a dark green and a light green, wasn't it, Charlie? Yeah. Light and dark green, but so it was attractive, even though it was metal. We were so proud of our airplane, we even had carpet. Carpet yeah. <laughs> on the, remember, Charlie, the carpet we had yeah. uh -huh. to make it to make it look like home. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> we, we were in these airplanes a lot, and, and we, did, we did first class maintenance. We really believed in good maintenance because we were flying the machines ourselves. Yeah, yeah used to wash our airplane down and one day it was kind of cloudy like we have here today and, and uh, I looked over there and there was a big storm heading our way so I told Bob I said let's put soap all over the airplane and then the rain will wash it off you know <laughs> well we did we put soap all over the airplane but the rain went around us uh -oh. And then the soap dried off there, and we had a terrible time yeah. trying to wash that airplane off. Yeah. <laughs> Celery wasn't your main thing. Tell us about what ended up being your, your main business. One of the big flower growers that had a big farm in Hastings, Florida, 
visit us while we were working on the airplane. And he said, when, the, when our flowers are ready, we'd like you to fly them to New York and Boston. And we gave him a price and everything was uh, okay. And so we, we knew we had business down the road. And the first contact we had in New York was the, the old New York Herald Tribune. Newspaper. Newspaper, I think the best newspaper in the world at the time. Mm -hmm. They called and asked if they could fly the papers to Florida. Of course, we were delighted. Okay, <laughs> so, so you're flying flowers north, flying newspapers exactly south. right. Signed up with the Herald Tribune, then the New York Times called. Mm -hmm. Then we had a real problem because Herald Tribune wanted exclusive use of the uh -huh. airplane. Uh -huh. So, and here, the new, here we have the opportunity of taking on the New York Times. Yeah. So, the, our, our operation manager and I, we off to New York, and we talked to the, <laughs> like a Dutch uncle to the to the to the people at the Herald Tribune, uh -huh. pleading with him, to yeah. let us take the Times. But you know they were competitive, yeah, sure. they, and they didn't. And, and Herald Tribune didn't want the Times on the airplane. Uh -huh. But but uh, and a newspaper isn't worth very much if it if it doesn't get distributed quickly. And I know you guys you you racked up quite an impressive record of getting those newspapers down south. On time. Tell me about that record. Well, I, I, th I think we're most proud of our performance. I think we operated six years and we never canceled a flight. Never once. Never canceled a flight. Wow. I mean... And this is before GPS. This is before... Right. This is the old days. It, this is at the start of ILS. Yeah. The instrument landing uh -huh. system, the original landing system. It's that we, we, we would take off with almost zero, zero condition. Because uh -huh. we were flying cargo and had no passengers to worry about. So, but uh, but <laughs> that's still uh, remarkable. Remarkable. Uh, we, 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 maybe, I think maybe we were lucky too. <laughs> On tomorrow's show, we climb in the cockpit with Bob and Charlie, and we'll also learn about the fourth member of their team, the first female cargo pilot in the world. That's tomorrow as we continue with the story of Coastal Airlines. Next up, no pun intended, is a story about the day a B-17 Flying Fortress and a P-51 Mustang were seen in the skies over Shell Point. Tom Jones, the son of Turban resident Betty Lintz, took advantage of the visit of these flying museum pieces to get a ride of a lifetime. On Tuesday of last week, a World War II P-51 Mustang fighter plane put on a spectacular show low over the river just off Shell Point. Many of us were asking, what was this blast from the past doing over Shell Point? As it happened, the Cullings Foundation of Massachusetts operates a flying museum of classic military aircraft. They've made over 2,000 stops in cities from Florida to California over the last 18 years on their Wings of Freedom tour. Last week, they were right here in Fort Myers. Their B-17 Flying Fortress, B-24 Liberator, and P-51 spent three days at Page Field. When these legendary World War II fighting machines come to town, visitors have a chance to see them up close and even get inside the bombers. And a lucky few can even take advantage of the opportunity to take a flight. This particular P-51 is a rare two-seat dual control version. My name is Tom Jones. I'm standing here with my mother, Betty Lynns, from Turban Court. Just a couple of days ago, I was uh, flying this P-51, which you might be able to see in the background. They're just getting ready to take off now for their flight to Boca Raton. They've been here for about three days. And some of you might have seen us as we flew over the beach there at the Tiki Hut at Shell Point. Hope you got a good show. Next year, if we can find out a little bit in advance that we're going to be there, we'll let you know so more people can come down and see it. So I'm just going to ask my mother quickly here before this P-51 fires up in the background uh, what she remembers about seeing this thing just a couple of days ago. We saw the show uh, just off our Tiki Hut in Shell Point. And it was fantastic. It was like a national air race show. And we saw the loops of the barrel rolls, and, and they went uh, real close to the water. And it, uh, as many people at Shell Point as we could get a hold of in such short notice were all there. And just one woman came up to me afterwards, and she said, gave me a hug, and she said, give your son a big hug because it was wonderful. And we, I'm just so excited. Excited. That's all I can say. Just excited. And that, you know that my son was on the P-51 and actually flying it. And he is not a pilot. Well, that's one of the great advantages here in this P-51. 
uh, you go along for a half an hour or an hour and they will let you fly the plane. He, this guy taught me how to do an aileron roll. If any of you were flying or flyers out there, pilots out there, you know what I'm talking about. So it was pretty exciting for me. It moved my face around a little bit when he ran me through a couple of G's on the tight turns. Uh, but it was a lot of fun and we hope that you guys saw it. And if you didn't, we'll try to catch you next year. Residents Betty Lintz and Helen Armstrong are sisters. Their brother Harry was a 23-year-old B-17 pilot and was lost over Germany on his third mission. Helen's brother-in-law, Sterling, who she knew in high school, left for England three weeks later. He was 19 and a waste gunner in the B-24. Sterling flew missions beyond his quota, including four missions on D-Day, and survived the war. Another survivor is Florida resident Lieutenant Colonel Leo Gray, one of the original Tuskegee Airmen. Leo flew 15 combat missions over Europe in the P-51. After the war, he joined the Air Force Reserves for a total of 41 years of distinguished military service. Colonel Gray is now 81 and got a P-51 ride to the tour's next stop in Boca Raton. Tell him that my, the ship's name is Betty Jane and that's my name. Oh, that's right, the P-51, the name of the P-51 is Betty Jane and that's her name and it's fired up in the background. Maybe we want to hear this thing take off. The visit of these rare remaining fighting airplanes was a wonderful chance to commemorate the many patriotic and brave Americans who served our country so heroically in so many ways during an era of great struggle for freedom. Now it's time to cover all of Monday's happenings, Academy News, Menus, and Village Church Connections. Right after this word from David Howenstein with a preview of his radio show on TV, Listening to the Words. This week's Listening to the Words program is dedicated to everyone's grandparents and their grandchildren. Now, one of the stanzas of a soliloquy for grandpa ends with the words, The kid in me, the kid in me is a playful pup. The kid in me, the hunky spunky kid in me, refuses to grow up. Then there's uh, a grandma remembered for saying to the children, child, when you come up against a wall you can't climb, just take a step at a time and get around it. Also on the program, you'll enjoy Shell Point's Ann Wharton dialoguing with an ornery grandpa. And your taste buds will be tickled by a restaurant full of Italian grandmas. I'm your reader host, David Howenstein, inviting you to a 30-minute grandparents program on Shell Point Channel 12 all day, every day this week on Listening to the Words. Hi, I'm Mary Franklin with all of your Labor Day festivities today. Reminder that administrative offices are closed, but we still have a lot going on and we're going to start at 845 with virtual bowling in the Resident Activity Center. The men's match play will take place at 9. And at 9.15, your choices is billiards in the Resident Activity Center or pottery in the tunnel. And 10.30, the Disciples Men's Study Group will be gathering in the game room. 10.45 is the time for table tennis clinic in the tarpon room. And I hope that you had a light breakfast because there's going to be a crystal, day, crystal Room celebration for Labor Day today from 11 to 2 with live music. Enjoy the fun. 12 o'clock, Mahjong will be played in the Sable Room. And the game of Samba will be played at 1.15. And your other 1.15 choice is Table Tennis in the Tarpon Room. The BDIB Club will meet today in the Oak Room at 2 o'clock. And Duplicate Bridge will be played at 6.30 in the game room to wrap up your Labor Day festivities. Well, don't forget, tomorrow is the first business day of the month, so your sign-up for all of the September activities and the happenings will begin at 8.15 at either service desk. I'm Mary Franklin. Have a great day. Menus for Monday. The Crystal Room is featuring its Labor Day lunch buffet for $14.95, and they will be closed for dinner. And the soup of the day is cream of chicken. 
In the Island Cafe for lunch on Monday, the special is a chicken tender wrap with onion rings for $7.25. The dinner special is baked chicken with mashed potatoes and herb carrots for $8.25. And the Palm Grill is closed for the month of September. All menus are available 24 hours a day at www.shellpoint.net. Well, I wish to welcome you and wish you a blessed Labor Day. I'm Don Stainhook, the chaplain for the employees here at the Shell Point Retirement Community, and this is Connections for the Village Church. I'm here with Roy Nestor, who is the safety coordinator here at Shell Point. And on Labor Day, you and, you and I are going to talk about how in our various vocations, we are answering God's calling and seeking to serve Him. Welcome, Roy. Thank you, Don. I'm glad to be here. You've been at Shell Point now almost two years? Uh, yeah, going October will be two, two years. Okay. Mm -hmm. And your duties here at Shell Point include what? Well, I'm responsible for employee safety and uh, health. Uh, mainly following the OSHA regulations as far as the Shell Point facilities and the employees that work here. So it's your job to keep us safe? Yes, yes, yes and make sure we're playing the rules. And the question of the day is how does your current position allow you to answer God's call on your life and serve Him not only when you're not on the job but also when you're here at work? Uh, thank you, Don. That's a great question. Um, I uh, have always loved uh, the world of safety. Uh, from the earliest years of my life, I was a uh, volunteer firefighter mm -hmm. right on up through, uh, you know, a 30-year career in a large urban county. And uh, it was always about safety and saving lives. Mm -hmm. And I just think God's... Uh, calling on my heart has been to uh, to help save lives yeah. in that process whether it's from a fire or a vehicle accident or right here in a, a lift truck or an unsafe building or a fall protection anything that could take the life or seriously injure a worker to me would greatly impact their ability to um, to serve their world and to serve God and to know God if they were injured or they lost their life. That would be the ultimate tragedy. Mm -hmm. So I enjoy what I do uh, and I take my work seriously and uh, I love Shell Point because Shell Point also loves doing the right thing mm -hmm. and also loves to serve God in their mission and it is sort of a mission. It's a wonderful opportunity you have too because I think you probably interact with all the employees at one time or another. Yes, you almost have to. Uh, you have to be out on the front lines. My goal every day is to be with the employees as much as possible, but at least a half of, the, of my work day because mm -hmm. there's a lot of administrative stuff too. But I like, try to get out there with them. I know that in my position, sometimes I'm dealing with employees that are distracted because of personal burdens and concerns, and I would imagine that you run into that occasionally too. Sure. It's very easy when, uh, when you're uh, working out of an 86-foot lift truck or boom truck or whatever to be distracted and uh, not use your, clip in your, your lanyard or your body harness properly. Yes. Yes. It could have devastating results. Uh, so we're always, we have 11 safety committees we've created under the, the large safety council mm -hmm. and their mission is to uh, create an action plan that keeps safety on the forefront and it's had, we've had tremendous results. Yeah, when you look around the property and you see some of these tall buildings with windows and other things that have to be washed and maintained, right? Um, safety certainly is a very big concern here at Shell Point. Yes, yes, and uh, Shell Point fully uh, in their mission, uh, which is a wonderful mission, is to a uh, caring mission, certainly encompasses their workers. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes working at Shell Point really special for me because they do and embrace that, uh, that the regulations are written in the, the, the loss and tragedies of others that have gone on before us. And they recognize that. And not all companies do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a pleasure to interview you, and it's a wondrous thing that you have your position here at yes. Shell Point. 
and it's such a blessing to have a person with your faith commitment interact with our employees and help to keep them safe and give them a word of encouragement, a word of instruction, and um, show that we care. Yes. Thank you, Roy. Thank you, Don. And have a blessed Labor Day, and remember those who work so hard here at Shell Point, providing the safety and the security and all of the conveniences that our residents enjoy. We're glad you joined us for today's show. Tune in tomorrow when we'll continue the story of Bob Anderson of Turbin, who helped to found one of the first ever cargo airlines. His cross-country adventures were made all the more special with the addition of a female co-pilot. And we'll get some airborne war stories from Nautilus resident Nip Wilson. Until then, this is Shell Point Today for Monday, September 1st. I'm Dan Philgreen, and from all of us here at Shell Point TV, we hope you have a great day, and we'll see you back here tomorrow.